Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, boys, and girls. Welcome to today's video. We're going to be continuing on with the, the Luke series, the one that we did last video. We did Luke 1 through 2. Now we're going to do Luke 3 through 9. So it's going to take up a good chunk of it. I believe there's two or three more videos after this. We're going to go ahead and get right into it. I really like the animation style. We left off where baby Jesus was born, um, basically, in this really rundown, you know, animal farm. And uh, these random shepherds were called by an angel to go, you know, cater to this. And Jesus was basically born. We heard about Zachary and how Zachary had a baby. And that baby whose name was John. John the Baptist or Yahya in, in Islam. And yeah, we're going to go ahead and jump right into this. Three through nine. The Gospel according to Luke began by telling us about the births of John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth. And in the next section of the Gospel, Luke zooms forward in time. So John is now a prophet and he's leading a renewal movement down at the Jordan River. And all of these Israelites are coming to be baptized. The poor, the rich, tax collectors, even soldiers. Yeah, what's going on here? So all of these people are dedicating themselves to a new way of life. By getting dunked in a river? So long ago, Israel came to inherit this land by crossing through the Jordan River. And God gave them a responsibility. They were called to serve him alone, to love their neighbor, and pursue justice together. And we know from stories in the Old Testament that they failed at this repeatedly. Right. So John's calling Israel to start over, to go back through the river and come out rededicated to their God, ready for the new thing that God's about to do. And so it's within this renewal movement that Jesus first appeared. Jesus is baptized by John and the sky opens up and a voice from heaven says, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now, God's words here are packed with echoes from the Hebrew scriptures. This first line is from Psalm 2, where God promised that a king would come who would rule in Jerusalem and confront evil among the nations. And then this next line is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, and it refers to the Messiah who would become a servant and suffer and die on Israel's behalf. After this, Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days with no food. I mean, that's roughing it. And in this story, Jesus is replaying Israel's 40-year journey through the wilderness where they failed to trust their God and so they rebelled. But Jesus succeeded by resisting temptation and trusting God. And so this story is marking Jesus as the one who's going to carry Israel's story forward. After the wilderness, okay. Jesus comes back to the region of Galilee, to his hometown, Nazareth. He's in the synagogue and he's invited to read from the scriptures. And he opens up the scroll of Isaiah and he reads, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Why to the poor? Well, in Hebrew culture, being poor wasn't just about money. It was more about low social status. So women and children and the sick, people on the margin. And surprisingly, this could include people who had money, like tax collectors. They were considered outsiders too, and so Jesus is here for them. Then Jesus continues reading. The Lord has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Freedom seems like a big deal for Jesus. Yes, Jesus was freeing people from their sicknesses, from their past, from their shame, and he was freeing them to become a part of God's new kingdom that Jesus said he was bringing into reality. After this, Jesus appoints 12 men from among all of his disciples as leaders to help him in his mission. And that number, 12, it's a very intentional symbol of the 12 tribes of Israel. But this is a ragtag bunch of guys. You've got a fifth. Number 12 comes up a lot, not, not just in Christianity and Islam and Judaism. The number 12 is huge. You guys ever see 12? No, like 12 months, 12 disciples. In Islam, there's 12 imams in, in, in Shia Islam. There's 12, um, I don't know, I'm getting a brain fart. Just look at number 12. Number 12 comes up a lot. There's 12 tribes of Isaac. There's 12 tribes of Ismail. There's, um, the number 12 just comes up a lot. There's something about the number Fishermen, you got a former tax collector who worked for the Roman occupation. You have a former rebel who fought against the Roman occupation. There's no way these guys are going to get along. Yeah, Jesus intentionally brought together people who were outsiders and sworn enemies. But inside God's kingdom, they're called to reconcile and to live in unity. Following Jesus meant entering a new world order. 
And so Jesus went on to teach, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you because of me. Jesus even told his disciples to love their enemies, be strangely generous, even to people they don't like, to forgive and show mercy. This is a radical way of life. And Jesus not only taught about all of this, he promised that he would lead the way, that he would be radically generous and forgive and love his enemies by making the ultimate sacrifice, by giving up his life. The last story in this section of Luke is fascinating. Jesus takes some of his disciples up onto a mountain and God's glory appears as a bright cloud and Jesus is suddenly transformed. And there's two other prophets that appear, Moses and Elijah. Yeah, they're the ancient prophets who also experience God's glory on a mountain. And then God speaks from the cloud saying, this is my son, listen to him. Luke is showing us that Jesus is the ultimate prophet. He is God's word to Israel. The three of them talk about what Jesus is. Jesus is the ultimate prophet. He is God's word to Israel. I agree with that statement. He is the ultimate prophet. He is the one that's going to come back at the end of the times, abolish all the garbage, the Antichrist, and bring people back to the truth. Now, he's a prophet in the eyes of Muslims. He's not God, and God cannot be born. So that's where our it's going to do differences when he arrives. In but Jesus himself, what Jesus did, what Jesus came to do, Jerusalem. We're all for it. What's he going to do? He's going to go to the capital city to be enthroned as Israel's true king, but not in the way that anybody expected. And with that, Jesus' mission up in Galilee comes to an end. And the next part of Luke's gospel begins with his long journey to Jerusalem. Awesome. So we got chapter 9 to 19 left in Luke. Not chapter, but you know. Verse, not verses, a verse is like a line. I'm so sorry, whatever. Luke 9 through 19 was going to be next. Awesome, awesome, awesome animation. I like the story being told like this. It's really, really cool to kind of like see it and visualize it and kind of understand what's happening. Um, this is a story of Luke. Like I said, there's stories in other gospels. So you got, you got the gospel of John, the gospel of Mark, the gospel of Matthew, um, and all of these different people have different, witness accounts of what happened in different stories and some of these stories correspond with each other and those stories that correspond with each other we usually take as 100% true or a it happened because eight people said it happened the cross verification is what makes it authentic so it's really really awesome to see the channel is called bible project i'm going to continue to link it down below if you guys want to see parts um the first part, you can go ahead in the description and click that. If you guys want to see future parts, you can go ahead in the description and click that if they're already out. And I appreciate you guys for coming in today. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you in chapter 9 through 19. And peace out. God bless. And we'll see you in the next one.